Welcome to Her Remarkable History. Remember to support our channel, please subscribe. The rebellious daughter of Queen Victoria. Victoria and Albert had nine children together. These children would go on to create many of the leading royal families in Europe and change the face of history. But one child, Princess Louise, made her mother think she would be different in the moments that she came into the world. 1848 was the year of Europe's age of revolution, and it was also the year that Princess Louise was born. When Queen Victoria gave birth to her daughter, she immediately knew that Louise would be something peculiar, and she was right. Victoria, by this point, had given birth five times, and when it came to the birth of Louise, she didn't want to go through the excruciating pain of labour and childbirth again. So Victoria defied all of her advisers and opted for a controversial new treatment and form of pain relief, chloroform. Victoria said, It made labour delightful, because, well, chloroform made her a little high on the remedy. As Louise got older, she became a little firecracker. She defied the rules that children should be seen and not heard, and she was too inquisitive for the liking of the family. She was given the nickname Little Miss Y because she asked too many questions and the more Louise matured, the more she rebelled against the grain and the standards and expectations she had placed upon her. It was when Louise was just 13 years of age that her father, Prince Albert, died and she was struck with grief and an overwhelming sadness. Louise and Victoria's relationship was a little strained but Louise was the favourite child of her father and losing her dad was incredibly difficult for her to manage and cope with, and to make matters worse, Victoria wasn't around to support her. Victoria was so distraught after the death of her beloved husband that she could not hold herself together. For this, her children suffered. She was not there to hold their hands through the grief of losing their father. Louise suffered due to the death of her dad, and essentially her mum too. For with Albert now dead, Victoria was numb. Louise became withdrawn and down, and she was in a dark place. Yet, with everything stacked against her, she forged her way forward. At the age of 17, Louise was to have a coming out in society ball. She was so excited to finally be able to step back into public life. But Victoria, who was still mourning three years after Albert died felt that the ball should be cancelled to represent this. Louise was so upset and furious. She and her siblings were therefore unable to move forwards with their lives. Louise, however, had other ideas and she grew a talent for getting under her mother's skin and although Victoria struggled with Louise, she, following tradition, made her her personal secretary. Louise was very good at this, but she found it incredibly boring that is, until her younger brother's tutor, a commoner, Robinson Duckworth, entered the scene. Louise fell head over heels with him. The issue, however, was that it was wildly inappropriate and he was 14 years older than she was, and also a reverend. Victoria, seeing what was happening, dismissed the tutor from the royal palaces, and for a moment she felt she had the situation under control. Louise, however, would soon again throw a curveball at her mother in terms of her love life. Victoria was very weary of Louise, and as a result, the relationship between the pair grew sour. She would call out Louise for her disobedience and call her indiscreet. She felt she got pleasures from arguing, and that, as Louise would not hold her tongue, no topic of conversation was safe within the royal walls. Louise, however, would break free from these walls and carve a name for herself, even if the impression was scandalous. Louise had endured the tutoring of her father, and it was a very rigid system. She was able to now seek the education she wanted and blossom into the person she was always meant to be. She became a sculptor, and she stunned England. She was enrolled into the National Art Training School and, as it was scandalous for a woman to become an artist, Louise broke the mould. The path she chose was male-dominated and full of critique, especially against a royal princess. However, Louise chose a career 
that was nothing compared to the drama that would unfold in her personal life. She knew many, many men, and she always was the subject of gossip. Her affairs even spread into the personal secretaries of her mother. Louise, however, preferred that the affairs remain secret. But affairs, it seems, were the last of her worries. It's easy to see why men fell over themselves for Louise. The princess was absolutely beautiful, with her pale skin, her dark hair and her slender figure. She was the Victorian's era ideal woman of jaw-dropping beauty. To this day, she is often called Queen Victoria's most stunning daughter. Louise was proving to be quite a handful, and Victoria struggled with her at times. You see, there was a lot of cover-up work carried out to protect the family. According to some sources, Louise had an affair with yet another tutor of her brother's, a Walter Sterling, and it was this relationship that sent the royal family into a panic. Louise and Walter had, it seems, an illegitimate child, or so it was claimed. Queen Victoria's doctor adopted said child and named him Henry Locke, and all of his life he claimed he was in fact the son of Princess Louise. No one knows for certain, however, as even today the royal family have barred attempts to get a DNA test. However, in all the scandal and rebellion... Louise still found time to dedicate herself to philanthropy. She felt that she couldn't just work for the royal family, but that she should also serve the British public. And so, while she worked as her mother's secretary, Louise also helped open a hospital for children and became the face of philanthropy. But for all the good deeds of Princess Louise, she was running on a clock. She was nearly 20, and in the Victorian standards, she should now start looking for a husband. All of her sisters had married into royalty, but she refused to marry a man who was a member of any royal family. She felt that the prospect of marriage to another royal was awfully unappealing. She was strong-minded and stubborn, and she knew exactly what she wanted, and she was not going to back down. Her family was so busy searching all of Europe for a husband but Louise had found herself a suitor in a man named John Campbell. He was a nobleman, but as he wasn't a prince to the royal family, he was nothing. Despite the high standing of John Campbell, the royal family strongly rejected the idea and thought it to be scandalous. However, eventually Victoria relented and stood up for her daughter and allowed her to marry John Campbell. In 1871, Louise and John married... Their marriage, however, sparked a scandal, as a British princess had not married a non-royal for hundreds of years, and the occasion actually saw the first implementation of chain-link barriers in the country for the couple's protection. During the wedding, Louise was in control. She decided what she wore. She even designed a veil out of lace. But the marriage, sadly, wouldn't be her happily ever after. After her marriage, Louise decided to ramp up her charitable efforts. She helped create the influential Ladies' Work Supply in 1871, a foundation that designed, created and sold embroidery to help those in poverty. The organisation selected Louise as their president, and she even worked as one of their designers. However, Louise felt trapped in England, so when her husband was chosen to be the Governor-General of Canada, Louise was over the moon. In 1878, the pair moved to Ottawa, Canada, but the transition was far from smooth. Canadians were not thrilled at the idea of a British crown putting its nose where it didn't belong. Louise, however, knew that she was special, and if she trod carefully, she would win them over and show them that she was a friend if she made a gesture of some kind. So Louise became notorious for her parties. They were controversial and had no class barriers. Everyone, no matter their status, was able to mingle. And although some higher class members of society despised this, it was truly a breath of fresh air for everyone else. Louise was a hit in Canada, and not only was she the first British royal to set foot in British Columbia, she was also a staunch advocate of the arts. She helped promote the founding of the National Gallery of Canada and the Royal Canadian Academy of Arts, she was so beloved that Canada named the province of Alberta and beautiful Lake Louise after her. However, 
Although Louise was very popular, her stay in Canada was far from drama-free. In 1880, she suffered a traumatic experience when she got into a serious sleigh accident. The carriage overturned and Louise was dragged through the snow for 400 metres. In the end, though, she had a concussion and her earlobe was torn into two. Though she was tough, this marked the beginning of a period of fragile health for Louise. This wasn't helped by the fact that Louise would often try strange new eating habits and exercise to try and maintain a slim figure. At one dinner party, she was reported as having only eaten four Brussels sprouts, so she apparently did not want to look like her mother. Before Louise left Canada, she endured one of the country's bloodiest moments, the North West Rebellion. Louise understood that no matter who won, these were humans putting their lives on the line, and so she created a medical fund and hired a doctor to provide medical attention to the men fighting on both sides, no matter their race, their creed or their colour. On return home to England, Louise was greeted by bitter jealousy from her sisters. They were so jealous of her beauty and her rebellion, and as such, their relationships suffered. However, saying that, Louise did get along with her brother-in-law, husband to Princess Beatrice, Prince Henry of Battenberg. Because of the rumours that flowed about the alleged affair with her sister's husband, Beatrice got very angry and upset with Louise. She, according to Louise, got her revenge by spreading a very dark rumour. It was claimed that Louise was romantically involved with Queen Victoria's private secretary, Arthur Big. Louise struck back by spreading a rumour of her own. She said that Beatrice made the whole thing up because she was jealous. And then Louise poured salt on the wound. After Princess Beatrice's husband and Princess Louise's rumoured boy toy, Prince Henry passed away. Louise claimed that she and Henry were much closer than Henry and Beatrice. She even went as far as saying that Beatrice meant nothing to her husband. You see, Louise didn't care what people thought about her, and she didn't care much for appearances. She did not hide her friendship with Henry, and since their bond was out in the open, rumours amounted that they were lovers. No one knows the truth about their potential love affair, but when Henry passed in 1896, Louise remarked that he was almost the greatest friend I had. I, too, miss him more than I can say. Louise did, however, get along with one sister, but tragedy struck. When she was in Canada, she received the news that Alice and two of her daughters had died from diphtheria. Another sad note is that both Alice and their father, Prince Albert, died on December 14th, a date which must have been a truly dark and upsetting day for Louise. Another point is that Louise was secretly a suffragette. She became a voice for the suffragist movement and Queen Victoria despised this. And she wasn't shy about her utter detest either. She expressed repulsion over the thought of women practising medicine and Louise, openly defying her mother, became friends with Elizabeth Garrett, the first British woman to publicly practise medicine. Louise and her husband were not getting along, and their marriage was in trouble. They had lived apart for long periods, and Louise, at the end of the day, simply preferred the company of other men. But perhaps so did her husband. There was a rumour that he was in fact gay. Louise did not mind that he was gay, for their marriage was simply a marriage of convenience. What she, however, did mind was his night prowling. Apparently, he would go cruising in the night, and to stop this, Louise closed off all of the windows in the apartment. Now Louise and her husband were drifting further apart, and she spent a lot of time away from him. He believed he had the gift of clairvoyance and second sight, and became even more eccentric. This, however, gave Louise the space she wanted to live her own life on her own terms, and she even had affairs where she felt fulfilled in life. When she was living in Canada, she had an affair with an indigenous man who was modelling for her art, and this caused a great deal of gossip, and the Queen, Louise's mother, would have been furious at the thought of it. Victoria, in a sense, was quite cruel to Louise. 
when a sculpted statue was commissioned in her honour to mark 50 years on the throne, Louise had to submit her work anonymously to a panel, but even when Louise completed the statue, it was then rumoured that it was in fact her teacher, or lover, who completed the work, a Joseph Edgar Bowen. But, in spite of all the negative parts of her personal life, Louise took care of other women. She advocated for feminist movements and would randomly drop into factories and workplaces to ensure that women were being treated properly. She would also help widows pay for the funerals of their husbands. Now, even though John Campbell and Louise didn't have the best of marriages, they did remain married for life and even grew closer as the years went by. In 1911, when John became senile, Louise then needed to nurse him. Over the years, Louise lost all of those around her, and she became old and very lonely. In 1914, John died, and Louise was hit with a profound loneliness, and was stricken by grief. This led her to have a brutal nervous breakdown, and she's quoted as saying, "'My loneliness without the Duke is quite terrible.'" I wonder what he does now. But one silver lining of Louise getting older was that she and her sister Beatrice rekindled their friendship. When their mother, Queen Victoria, died, she left them houses that neighboured each other, and some may have even said that this was a ploy by Victoria to bring her children back together. When Louise and Beatrice found their health declining, they both moved into Kensington Palace and even shared neighbouring rooms. Sadly, though, as the years went by, Louise found she was confined to the palace and went from the royal family's wild child to a recluse. The late Queen Elizabeth II, as a young girl, even dubbed Louise as Auntie Palace, as she would only reign within the confines of Kensington. When Louise died, it was found that she still owed a shopkeeper 15 shillings for cigarettes. This, in today's money, would equate to around £250. Interestingly, as Louise knew her mother would have never have approved, she kept the fact she smoked a secret, even when she was a fully grown adult. Louise was poked fun at all of her life for saying she would outlive everyone due to her obsession with health food and exercise, something which it seems made up for her love of smoking. She came very close to keeping her word and died on December 3rd, 1939, at the age of 91. Louise left a large impact on Britain and the royal family, from illegitimate children and affairs to scandals and suffragettes, but the true length of her impact will never be known. For most items and documents and files have been hidden away that link to Princess Louise, Requests to research further into her life have been denied, and the full and true nature of the rebellious daughter of Queen Victoria sadly will never be known. Thank you for watching, and to support, please subscribe to Her Remarkable History. Thank you.